welcome to In the Demo, a show about the stories that get told about groups, how those stories got made, what we think those stories get wrong, and why it matters. You hosts? Farah Bostic is the founder and head of research and strategy of The Difference Engine, a strategic insights consultancy focused on helping business leaders make decisions. Adam Piano, author and brand consultant and managing director of brand strategy at Arizona State University. You are now in the demo. Hi, I'm Vera Bostic, and as of this recording, I'm a Gen Xer. I'm Adam Pierno, also Gen X. Together, we have lots of questions. Vera, great to see you again. What are we? What have we been debating for the past two months? We have been debating what is a millennial. <laughs> <laughs> we have yes. We have been debating. Are there millennials? That's that's the question. Is millennial a thing? What and where did the idea? You asked a question that blew my mind. We started with, what, where do these crazy ideas about millennials come from today? Yeah. Right? Like the avocado toast thing. They could be rich if they would just stop eating avocado toast. And some of the other outlandish bits. And your question was, wait a minute. Why are we talking about today? Why don't we go back? Where did we even come up with the idea that this group of people was this homogeneous super generation that needed to be talked about in this way in the first place? I went right back to 99, 2000 <laughs> um, and reading early like trend reports and surveys of this new generation that was being called various things. Um, and then somewhere in the midst of that, I got my hands on a book called Millennials Rising. And it occurred to me that I must still have this book. And then it occurred to me that it must be in one of my mother's storage units. And so I bought the book again. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, yes, that was where I got most of the uh, the original ideas about what millennials were supposed to be. And that instead of being this like hard to manage, want a seat at the table, eating avocado toast, whatever we want to say about them <laughs> now, that they had started out as these exemplar children who trusted their, you know, trusted the government and had good relationships with their parents and generally were optimistic about their futures and everything was up and to the right for millennials. I think what we're going to be exploring together and what we've, the research we've been doing into all that is partially what are the foundational theories and hypotheses or, or outright just claims that were made either with data or sometimes Absolutely. With vibes. Yeah, like, <laughs> this seems good. Yeah. Um, but also, what do those expectations do? What do those expectations lay on someone? And uh, we identified at the top were Gen Xers. And I remember being told for five straight years how much of a slacker I was. Mm -hmm. And thinking like, okay, I can, <laughs> listen, I can slack. <laughs> like, if that's what we're doing, nobody can slack off like I can. I'm the best. So I always thought if you're going to do something, be the best at it. Um, <laughs> and I wonder what impact that has on millennials from the earliest days. And even now, as the headlines continue to just bash them as an entire group of people and lump them into these categories that I'm sure more than half of don't fit into. Yep. Something that uh, you've pointed out is that each the cultural observation of each generation is a reaction to the generation that comes before it. So mm -hmm. if, if Gen X is, was observed as the slacker generation, uh, and neither you nor I strike me as a, as a slacker, uh, then the next generation would be observed as the opposite of that. Now, right. the question to me is where's the line exactly? Why is it a year? On January 1st, people just stopped slacking and started being this optimistic golden <laughs> child. Okay. <laughs> let's just, yeah. let's just say I go with that. I, I love it. Let's do it. Yeah. None of these lines are clean, right? Like arguably, well, not according to the, the, the people who apparently originated the, the name millennials, but like my brother born in late 1980 firmly identifies as a millennial. I'm born in late 76 
and um and don't <laughs> um but like raised in the same household only four years apart very different experiences of the world though yeah. like I, I you know you're th that four years makes all the difference in terms of what you experienced about culture and media and and the economy and everything else and so you can have millennials and gen x or children in the same household and the idea that like therefore it's a nice clean divide of generations just doesn't actually bear out in people's homes of course <laughs> so, you know. plus his experience is different because he had an older sister four years older so he had when he was a freshman in high school he had a senior right. in high school that that shapes his experience of growing up entirely differently sure. than someone born on the exact same day and maybe even in the same zip code that mm -hmm. doesn't have uh, that same you know family structure or household or or total right. experience yeah. uh, if your parents were together it's a different set of circumstances your school could be good or bad you're mm -hmm. taking the bus to school or walking to school you know all these things contribute in a way that can't be totally factored in uh, across a, an entire population Especially a population we're saying is about 80 million people. Like it's it, drawing a circle around a 20 year span and tens of millions of people and saying, well, they're like this <laughs> is, you know, is pretty, I mean, pretty ballsy, to be yeah. honest. Like that's, that is a um, definition of hubris, <laughs> it seems to me. I think we, we should definitely put a bookmark in the idea of where, what are the, the boundaries and what is the level of hubris of somebody putting the the boundaries around it and saying like this is the time period and what is the what are some of the challenges that come with that and really look at that more closely let's get in the time machine look at what were some of the early prognostications and early characteristics of what was then called i don't know when they became millennials versus uh, gen y was the other was the other name, which again indicates the reaction to Gen X. Yeah. I mean, it seemed like it, it sort of did some battle for a little while. Um, from what I was able to find, Gen Y seems to have been coined by ad age. <laughs> um, and Always the, a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> known for their, their research and intellectual rigor. Yeah. And meanwhile, these, these guys who wrote Millennials Rising had been using the term Gen X since 87 when these kids are starting kindergarten and then we're thinking about all right so they're they're the they're the class of 2000 right that's that that's i think kind of where that begins to be the name wait you mean um, you mean millennials you said gen yes. x oh, oh sorry okay. yes i did not mean gen x i meant millennials um i'm a you know self-centered gen xer who's just slacking my way through this podcast <laughs> <laughs> As one um, does, as one does. <laughs> exactly. And then you get into like um, some kind of basic demographics that were happening at the time. So it was, you know, yet another generation of an increasingly diverse um, generation of youth. Um, and there were a ton of them. So there, there was sort of an idea that in the sort of 70s into the early, well, re really the 70s, there was this birth dearth. And that was part of what characterized Gen X, even though there were, in fact, more Gen Xers than there were boomers. Um, and then there were more millennials than there were <laughs> Gen Xers. But like it, there was a sense of a, a baby boom that happened in the early 80s. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so you had a lot of them. So you have a lot of them. They're diverse. They just inherently understand technology. They buy a lot of stuff and they're good kids. Yeah. And let's, let's work backwards from the, let's start where you, where you finish that list. So the, the demographics and the size, the audience sizing, mm -hmm. um, we we've discussed, we've seen estimates going back to 2000 and, you know, up through what I, when do you think the peak of millennials reporting was, was it 2010, 2015, as they were maturing into home buying, car buying consumers? I think that's probably right. Um, I think there's kind of a, you know, a historical trend line of once you cross 35, marketers stop caring about you. And yeah. so they stop writing about you that much in, right. in the media. So yeah, that's probably about right. 2015, something like that. Yeah. It's like once we know that they can be targeted through NFL games, then we don't need to write about them anymore. We know where to yes. get them and we don't have to have like conferences dedicated to where to research. Yes. They're no longer millennials. They're dads and moms. Yeah. So shameful. <laughs> um, but they, there were differing lists, but a lot in the 20, 
in that 2005 to 2010 range was still saying this could be more than a hundred million people. Mm -hmm. This, this, the, the name you referenced boomers. Um, one of the other names given to Gen Y slash millennials was echo boomers. Yeah. And that's relevant both in terms of the theoretical scale of the, the generation, but also as a response to the values of baby boomers at that time, not when they were the same age, because their values mm -hmm. were pretty similar <laughs> at the same age. But when they when they were parents, some of this was a response, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, you know, there's there there are even some good quotes in the in the Millennials Rising book from some boomer parents. I think they must be teachers that they interviewed, but talking about it's not until you have kids of your own that you realize <laughs> um that it's probably better to treat kids well than to not. You start looking at how your own parents treated you, which was like come back in time for dinner. <laughs> like that kind of get out of the house, leave me alone, come back in time for dinner. Um, you know, my my dad had stories of like when the street lamps turned on in Southern California, that's when he was supposed to come home. And that was his signal that he, it was okay to come back to the house. Yeah, <laughs> But otherwise he was expected to just get lost. Like totally. get out of here. Yeah. I think the rule for us was when you hear your dad whistle ah. and, and my dad had this <laughs> incredible whistle, you know, and I, you could hear him from down the street or from wherever I was. I'd be like, Oh, and I would just go running home. <laughs> so that was it. Six o'clock. Dad whistled, get home. So yes. It was a different time. Um, Indeed. But that 100 million person generation did not bear fruit. I mean, that did not turn out to be, well, depending on what years you include, mm -hmm. it obviously would shrink the number of people born during those years. So it changes right. the size of the audience. It ended up being closer to, what's the number you, you put it at? 70, 80? So, so this article from 2002 or the speech from 2002 says 70 plus million. I keep kind of hearing a rough 80, 81, something like that million. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely not finding anything that says the current size or the the peak size at like 2015 was a hundred million for sure. No, I never think it, it didn't reach that. I think, but in the, in the two thousands, I remember reading that's yeah. how big, that's how big it could be. And that was part of the purchasing power exactly. conversation. I think the other part of that idea of how big they were going to get was not actually just like endemic birth rates in the U.S. It was also increasing immigration. And so there was I think there was an idea that 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 immigration curve was just going to continue kind of indefinitely and that people were just going to keep coming to the U.S. But of course, um, the the concerns about demographic change and majority minority and immigrants taking jobs and all of that kind of stuff um, started to tamp down on how much immigration was happening by the time you get into the late 90s. And certainly from the Bush administration, the second Bush administration on um, and 9-11, you know, you have a, a massive kind of tamp down. So maybe that last 10 million, you know, didn't make it across the border, essentially, because the, the winds had shifted from being generally in favor of immigration to generally against it. Yeah, it, that's an interesting piece. The the idea of the increasing size of the generation, um, the cohort, I guess, and then the increasing the growing diversity of that population, which looking at a crystal ball and thinking, okay, before 9-11, yes, I understand this prognostication in 98, 99, 2000, you know, even the first six months of 2001. And then again, when Obama is elected, I think, oh, okay, it could reignite, you know, more, more optimism among people that would, I would think would come to the U.S. Mm -hmm. But then the Great Recession comes and changes yep. the course of a lot of policy and a lot of ability for people to, to migrate and move around. So it doesn't, yes, over 22 years, some of that diversity promise has come true but not to the degree or at the trajectory that was projected in mm -hmm. a lot of the millennial writings that were written around this time, around 2000, right. in the early, early days. Some of that is like the the kind of um, latency of you know reporters and columnists. So like by the time they're looking at a thing, things have may, may have already changed. And so, yeah, there was sort of this like pretty steep increase in population in part due to, to immigration. 
And then it was leveling off at the point in time that they were like looking back going, oh, look at all those immigrants. <laughs> you know, And so oh, look at all these kids. Yeah. And so suddenly it's like, well, if we take what the what the, you know, slope of the of the curve looked like up to yesterday and project it forward, then it'll be 100 million people. But of course, by that point, things were already tapering. And that's just that just seems to be a thing that um, the news media in particular falls victim to from time to time from projecting yeah. any kind of trend. And we have the luxury of hindsight and we have the luxury totally. of going back in data and checking the sources and trying to figure out how they got to the argument. And we'll be doing that is looking at where did they go wrong? What were they looking at that made them think that? Or was it totally vacuous? I need to write something. <laughs> I have a deadline. <laughs> I have to say something. And this guy said something that sounded good. So I'll write something that sounds similar. Nobody will call yeah. me on it. It seems like best intentions were a part of us. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I also think it's like the the kind of world they were sitting in at the time that it happened, which was like, depending on where you sat, it was a largest peacetime post-war economic expansion in American history and all the rising tides lifting boats metaphors and yes. all of that sort of thing was going on. And it did just sort of feel end of history, like all of that stuff was just true now. And we were just going to be global capitalists from here on out with a general default to democracy. And, um, you know, Pax Americana had long since won and da, 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 da. Yeah. everything's great. The wall um, came down, we're forever. opening McDonald's in Moscow. Like, that's yeah. it. It's over. Totally. Yes. It's one exactly. culture now. The, yeah. the, the Friedman theory of democracy. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Two countries with a McDonald's will never go to war with each other. Um, but yeah, that that kind of thing was, I think, just in the air. And so why would you think it would suddenly come crashing down? Literally and metaphorically. There's also, you know, 2000 for for listeners who were not maybe old enough to know, to remember this time was an optimistic time in terms of the dot com boom. Yep. And the idea of technology veterans now, looking back, sounds absurd because I was working already in 2000 for, I graduated college in 97. I had already, you know, had a personal computer for a long time, grew up with one. And the idea of being a veteran of it, because I could write some C++, <laughs> it seems ridiculous, but I, but it's what's interwoven into that is the optimism of the dot-com boom, which was what we're actually living now, where anything that happens in the real world can be translated online. Mm -hmm. But in the year 99, 2000 and, and early 2001, there was a lot of experimenting and, and the stock market made us think it was going to definitely happen right then. Mm -hmm. Took a little time for us to figure it all out, but a narrative about a generation of consumers who understood technology inherently and could leverage it was really exciting and intoxicating idea. Well, and it was the idea of, you know, they, they had computers in the classroom. Um, there was the bridge to the 21st century program that I think was probably proposed under H.W. Bush, but actually went, you know, became a thing um, in the Clinton years. And, um, you know, I went to University of Oregon for my undergrad and started in 94. And so in 94, there were grants to state universities for Internet. Uh, and so, like, I remember it in, you know, starting the first week and part of freshman orientation was going to the computer lab to get your email address. Yes. And Same like, thing. you know, having, you know, knowing you had to, had to check your email for stuff from the school and, um, and also having classes that wanted the, you know, the deliverable for the class to be HTML. They wanted a web, a web page. Absolutely. Um, and that was a really easy way for me to do the easy part of um, of projects where I'd be like, I'll I'll take care of the HTML. And they'd be like, oh, it must be so hard. So we'll write the paper and then you put in the code. You do the coding. Yeah. <laughs> and I would be like, okay. half hour later, I'm yeah. done. <laughs> this is not that hard. Yeah. Drag picture here. Okay. Yes. <laughs> what about the idea, these two I stitched together, the relationship between the relationship to their parents, which were supposed to be these stable, beneficial, positive relationships to their parents, and the idea of being doers and overachievers. I, I link those two together. We can break them apart. No, I, I think they are related in, in, in the in the way that the kind of story gets told. I, I think you've got these um you've got these studies happening around that time of like, you know, and, and a lot of them are 
brand research or trend research or MTV is doing surveys or whatever. And Clinique did a survey of moms and daughters and said that, you know, 90% reported that they are very happy with their relationship. Of course, you know, think about like Clinique in 98, 99, 2000, they're marketing to fairly upscale middle class and above white yeah. women, mm. <laughs> you know, so like uh, not terribly shocked to find that 90% of them say they're very happy with their relationship. Um, also that they would say so is like, you got you got to grade that kind of a response on a curve anyway. I would like <laughs> to see the video of those together. interviews. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, when they're both carrying a bag full of Clinique products that they just purchased and the, the oh, mom yeah, has things just- are going put, great. Yeah. I'm thrilled. <laughs> I just got everything I wanted. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Exactly. And then things like teen research, unlimited doing some surveys of teens that were like, you know, two thirds of them saying that I really like doing things with my family and that that was very different from um, previous years that half of college bound high school students said their parents' opinion mattered most to them. Again, not knowing the context in which the question is asked and not knowing the mindset of the person answering it, my guess is like, well, if you're a college bound high school student, your parents' opinion is probably playing a pretty major role in which universities you're even applying to. So yeah, your parents' opinion, the people who are going to pay for your school, that would matter to you. And and that that (laughs) trend, I can tell you firsthand, is only increasing Uh, the parents are much more involved now. Now I would say for boomers, Gen Xers, it was, it was less of a, the influence was lower, but still present. Mm -hmm. But but starting with millennials, parents involvement in school selection and more involved in their life. For some of the people that we would say are millennials, I think that's really Mm -hmm. true. Yeah. And definitely the people that were interviewed as part of uh, millennials rising and this article that you found on the characteristics of Gen Y. I think. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's part it, of it is it, sample selection. A lot of it sample selection. That's exactly what I was about to say. Like we had recently looked up the 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 data on the average age of undergraduates and it's like a very large proportion of them, 40% something like that are 25 plus. And so like what you're picturing when you think of a college freshman is a 17 or 18 year old straight out of high school. And you're picturing someone increasingly, I think, who's um, because I think people have been shocked to discover just how many people are going to get the benefit of the federal loan cancellations. (laughs) Um, And especially for Pell Grant recipients, I think a lot of people underestimated how many college graduates are Pell Grant recipients. And so it's not all affluent white kids from Fairfax County, Virginia, who are, um, you know, going to their parents' alma mater and the parents are taking out a home equity line of credit to pay for the tuition because it's a lower interest rate than um, than FAFSA. (laughs) So like and they can write it off on their taxes in a in a more meaningful way than student loans. Like that that's not the average college student. So the idea of like college bound high school students you're already eliminating all these people who are into their 20s before they start college. Um which so like when you're thinking about what it is to be college bound, I think that's always um telling. And then like I said, you know, clinic labs, who are they going to be talking to? <laughs> you know, right. those those things start to show their rear ends a little bit more about about what they're what they're sampling for. And even some of the other sources that we saw were like highly educated millennials reporting X or, um, you know, children of highly educated boomers. Well, those also are not the majority of boomers. So that's again, we're self-selecting into a into a smaller and smaller group. Yeah. Sub segments, mm-hmm. which, yes. which which have to be factored. But what for this particular body of work, I don't know why. Every study into a subsegment converted into an application across 80 million people. Yes. You know, there there had been some real kind of investments in technology and infrastructure and higher education, the stock market, technology, like everything seemed to be kind of going pretty well if you were in those groups. You know, if you were um, living in extremely rural places, living in poverty, living, um, living in skin that wasn't white, then, you know, your mileage may vary. But the, that, that I think is part of where you get that general idea. You also have a lot of like, you know, reported quotes from kids of that age talking about how, um, they see government, not just as like a thing to lead them around, but also a thing that's worth being involved in. 
you know, it's a vehicle for change, a vehicle for positive change. And so, you know, I will one day also be doing this stuff. And again, that's probably a sample issue of like, who are you talking to and what are they adjacent to? Um, but you do generally get this sense of the authority figures in their lives were generally trusted by this particular subset of this so-called generation. Um and I think that that's part of why they tend to kind of get paired together in writing about them at this in this period. Um, and I think it's part of what's really fascinating about talking about them now, which I know we'll eventually talk more about, like the way millennials are described today and the kind of, oh, how the mighty have fallen that happens really kind of around the 2008 to the 2010 period. But at this point in time, when the future is all laid out before them, and these are mostly college bound kids being surveyed, um, you know. Uh, what what's not to love things things are going great everybody right. seems to be doing a good job especially at that time yeah yeah uh so we did have the benefit not only of of hindsight but we had the benefit of being able to test not just what millennials said then in a different way or look back at the sources but compare that to what the generation after them said in comparison mm -hmm. so the idea that uh, they are more trusting or more invested in government or they're better believers in government authority or however you want to phrase it. Uh, Ferry, you shared the monitoring the future survey, which is conducted annually. And we're able to track down 99, mm -hmm. 99 edition. And then we compared that against 2012, which is the most recent version I can find online. So you're taking someone 13 years later. Now, depending on where a millennial is defined, I don't think 2012 would still include millennials, but I don't know exactly what generation that would include, depending on what who's trying to sell you something or a, a <laughs> conference speaker. But looking at something more than 10 years apart, what I thought was significant, the Monitoring the Future survey for people who don't know runs a in-depth study among graduating high school seniors and uh, runs through all areas of life, all these various touch points. And there's a whole section on civics. So there's questions that I feel good. I feel that good citizens should go along with whatever the government does, even if they disagree, or I feel good citizens try to change the government policies they disagree with. People who get together in citizen action groups influence the government policy can have a real effect. There's eight to 10 questions that they ask every year. So the hypothetically, if they mm -hmm. had more trust, the 2000, the 1999 respondents would have been off the charts on in agreement with or in the positive for that alignment. Comparing those to the 2002 findings, not really a statistically different result. Hmm. And my belief is who you're able to reach with this survey, which I'm not sure of, mm -hmm. what schools, it's high school seniors, but what schools are you able to get students that will sit down and take this because the sample sizes for most of the questions are 2000 or more. Some of the, mm -hmm. some of the sample questions have ends in the over 10 thousands. Wow. But where you're able to reach these students may have a different outlook. Mm -hmm. And also myself being a student at one time, a high school student and a college mm -hmm. student, like I just had a totally different outlook than I have today. But looking at millennials, they don't stand out as more trusting of the government than the generation that came after them in 2012, where arguably, I would say it should be much lower if mm -hmm. I, you know, if I were a high school student coming out of the Great Recession at 2012, it was just turning. I don't think the optimism would have been as high for this group that was told, mm -hmm. was, was presented to us as the most optimistic generation and the most trusting. And no, they're actually mm. on par with this group from 13 years later. I wonder if it's possible that um, optimism and youth go together. That is a crazy theory. <laughs> <laughs> before life, before life beat you down, like we've been beaten down. I could yes. just sit here and be cynical. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's also interesting to me because I feel like we've had this ongoing conversation now about the death of civic education as well. And I do find myself wondering, like, it's so funny because you 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 survey these high school st students across time and they're all like reflecting back at the very least what you would think a civics teacher in high school would want kids to believe, yeah. right? That this is a system you can influence and you can do good things through it and like you can make a difference and people getting together and organizing it. Like all those things feel like straight out of my high school civics classes. Yes. 
And so like, in a way, it's a test of like, how effective are the messages being <laughs> conveyed by high school civics teachers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's They're doing like, a good job. Here's the final exam and here's the survey for monitoring the future. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I know the answer to this. Yeah, right. Yeah, good citizens go with the flow. That's right. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Right. My vote counts. Great. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I wonder now, like when people are saying like, oh, we need to do a better job of civics education. Do, do they mean like the nuts and bolts of how the system works or do they mean like teach a bit more cynicism? <laughs> and I just don't know. The last bit I wanted to talk to you about was on this idea of trust in institutions and government. Mm -hmm. You and I looked at this Pew study. Um, this, yeah. We have the longitudinal data, data on um percentage of people who trust the government in Washington always or most of the time. So Pew is fantastic resource for these longitudinal studies. And what's mm -hmm. incredible is that they, they start, they add the millennial generation in looks like 2004 is the first year. And for a generation that we were told had this trust in government, there is a little gap in the trend line and all this will be shared in the show notes, but over time to the point of that optimism, optimism fading, you can see it spiking and declining along with every, essentially all over everybody else's once you get to 2015. Uh, you can see them all sort of collapse into a neat line around, you know, it goes from a height of, there's a group of people in the silent generation and boomer generation that are 50% who say they always trust the government mm -hmm. in 2005. And pretty much all the groups are under 20% by the time we get to 2019 with millennials, mm -hmm. you know, just at maybe 19 and a half percent of people saying they always trust the government. I mean, I also find like, it's, it's so interesting now, especially with like talk of ending forever wars in that data set of looking at that October 6, 2001 set of numbers that spike yeah. where Gen X 62% trust the government to, in Washington almost or most of the time and boomers 59% silent generation 51% obviously the millennials aren't being tracked yet but that like real high level of trust three weeks after 9-11 um, or whatever a month after 9-11 is um, is pretty impressive given later conversations and I think the general shape of the chart is this slow decline kind yes. of thing and, and sometimes not so slow but even when you start introducing the millennials they have these gaps where they're significantly more um trusting in government than the other generations but the shape of the line is still a downward slope yeah it's a sharp decline because in 65 the the people being asked that question you know do, do you always trust the government in washington is at 80 percent. you know it's above 80 percent and now we're at this place where it is under 20% for every generation. So there are spikes and there are times where there are stand apart attitudes among the generations. And you can see some, some blue ocean between millennials and the other generations in uh, 2007 to 2011, weirdly. Mm -hmm. but then they then they do converge for the most part. And there's another little break from 2012 to 13, but mm -hmm. I don't think those would be statistically different from 2013 on to you. No, I, I wouldn't expect that. Yeah, it's it they're they're so close together there. It's also interesting going back to that that zoomed out view and seeing like how the real turning point is Watergate. <laughs> it's 72, you know. Yeah. It's like all of a sudden it's like, ah, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> The, the trend for millennials, the trend really starts, and my guess is 2009, 2010, when yeah. the banks are being bailed out. It's not necessarily, it, it's probably part of the economy, you know, the general downturn, people are losing homes. That's awful. Mm -hmm. So if you're either, if you're a millennial, that the way some people describe that, you could have been a college student or you could have been like a first time homeowner. 30, yeah, at that point. So you could have lost your home. Mm -hmm. And then the response of the government, the too big to fail um, time where where big America was being bailed out and little America was being it was suffering more. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's probably part of what what dropped us there in 2000, 2009, 2010. And then it did jump back up in, you know, 2010. The other interesting thing about this Pew study is they give you the date 
it's not an annual omnibus. That's an open survey that people go right. in and go at any given time. It is day and date. So for example, in uh, 1991. It's October 20th, 1991 was the date that was fielded. In in 2000, it's October 15th. In 2001, it's October 6th, to your point earlier. It's not you and I guessing general themes and moods. You could go back to that date and say, what were the headlines they were reading mm -hmm. leading up to this? So, you know, that's, that's the work we did to look back and try to figure this out. And essentially, when you get to 20... 15, everybody is saying you can't trust the government on both sides and you can't trust the media and you can't mm -hmm. trust anything except what I tell you, but maybe even don't trust me sometimes. Wow. Look at this. Trust starts falling. And that's true for millennials and all generations. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's funny because, you know, you, you had made a note in here about, uh, you know, the 2012 election and it seeming, you know, quaint, you know, two, two statement statesmen campaigning respectfully. And yet you have pundits saying, well, if I had to pinpoint a moment, it's when Mitt Romney spent his entire campaign being accused of killing Big Bird. I actually like take the point that that's absurd, <laughs> that like yeah. prior to that, other candidates had been accused of far worse. So fair enough. What made 2012 different was Twitter. Like the, these things got memed in a previous era. Binders full of women wouldn't have even been a gaff, right? Um, but it got seized upon in the Twitter sphere, and then that went nuts. Yeah. And you just didn't have that like extremely online is a lot of people kind of experience in previous elections. And so by the time you get to 2015, and major candidates on both sides of the spectrum are. Um, are saying the system is rigged and corrupt and you've got to drain the swamp and all of that stuff. Um, yeah. People are not feeling quite so upbeat about government. Anymore. Yeah. And you do, you see a, an increase, especially among millennials in, you know, that 20 coming from 2012 to 2013. And you made the excellent point that it, it wasn't just Trump that was, you know, in that 2016 when that, or, you know, leading up to that election, it was Bernie on the other side. Mm -hmm. saying like, Hey, they don't want, they don't want me in there. Let me tell you why. And it was a different type. It was almost more subversive. Bernie had people's attention in a way that was like, Oh yeah, it was more insidious the way he was. That message was more damaging in a, some way to a certain segment of voters. Yes. A certain segment of the population who are like, yeah, I don't trust this either. Now I was like, well, those right. people that were probably in that uh, monitoring the future study had been previously like, I trust the government. I, I will vote. My vote matters. I go mm -hmm. along with what the government says. And then they're like, wait a minute. You know, <laughs> the, the other day I was um, uh, referred to an episode of a um, Jacobin magazine podcast where they were interviewing a guy from Chapo Trap House. Not my usual content stream, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, but I was like listening to it going, wow. I mean, just the way this guy who's probably in all other respects very similarly situated to me got pilled so hard <laughs> about how bad capitalism is and what yeah. a joke democracy is is just shocking and um and it's not that he doesn't have a good like you know the 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 socialist or marxist critique of capitalism is a legitimate critique like it's worth discussing but it's like it clearly was this whiplash for a generation of people who really felt like no, it was possible to change the system with from within, that that was better than trying to challenge it from without, that good yeah. citizens, you know, vote and do what they're supposed to do. All of this is good stuff. And um, and then kind of getting, you know, feeling like Bernie helped the scales fall from their eyes. And now they see it for what it really is, right. which is a rigged system that will never let this um, <laughs> this guy be president. Yeah, the, the, uh, the sweet old Bernie, you know, he's not he wouldn't steer you wrong. You kidding me? <laughs> he's he's somebody's really nice lady. Why why would you ever uh, <laughs> why would you ever distrust this man? So in future episodes, we are going to continue trying to figure out who are some of those leading voices. We are going to examine some of the ways those original proclamations have been transformed over twenty years into the wild headlines that uh, people have been sharing with us. Uh, about millennials today and how <laughs> accurate or crazy those are at this point in time. Yeah. I mean, if you thought it was bad that Mitt Romney killed Big Bird, wait till you find out what millennials have killed. <laughs> Essentially everything. <laughs> yep. <laughs> 
where do these ideas come from and um, what about them is true and what about them needs more context and what about them is like, that's a big leap. Why'd you take that one? <laughs> and I think hunting for clues about what drives the, the the leaps of imagination that the pundit class takes when they start talking about groups of 80 million people at a time. You said it much better than I did. <laughs> On the next episode of In the Demo, Farah and Adam go back in time to unravel the change in tone around media's millennial narrative and begin seeking the ur text of America's millennial myth. I'm your robot host, Eliza. Please be kind. In the Demo is produced by Farah Bostic and Adam Piano, with support from the Difference Engine. Music by Omega Man, under the Creative Commons license. Go to InTheDemoPodcast.com for behind-the-scenes research and supporting information.